back in. Here I am. And our guest today is writer and director John D. Hancock. How are you, John? I'm good. I'm good. We have snow where I am, but other than that, everything really. Yeah. I'm I'm here in New York. It's like 60 degrees for some reason. I say well, it was yeah, it was in its sixties yesterday, but today it's snowing. So that... yeah. I say what a lovely spring we're having this winter. <laughs> Yeah. So, okay. So, um, please tell us a little bit about yourself. Give us a brief, uh, or even a long synopsis, whatever you'd like or break well, or break down. I grew up in the suburbs of Chicago and went to a large, very tough public high school. And then I went to Harvard. I went to New York and started working the theater right away. Did a hit off Broadway when I was 22 ran several big regional theaters, and then got a grant from the American Film Institute to make a short. Uh, it turned out funny and was nominated for an Academy Award. CBS bought it and showed it on the halftime or the Thanksgiving football game. And I started getting feature work out of that. And I did Bang the Drum Slowly. I did Let's Scare Jessica to Death. I did Leeds. I did Prancer. I've done a bunch of movies. I'm still working. I'm, I have a picture out now uh, called The Girls of Summer that I want people to watch. I'll definitely check that. I saw that on IMDb. Um, it's, you know, it's amazing. You know, like I, I, I always love doing what I, I love. I think people should do what they enjoy. And as long as you do enjoy it, like no matter no matter what point you are in your career, you, you know, keep going. Like unless you really want to retire. But if you really enjoy what you do, you'll. You, you, some people just never want to retire, even yeah, when they're I wanna, retired. I want to. I want to drop on the set, you know. <laughs> like, well, somebody said that. Let it, do what you love and let it kill you. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's funny. I realized you did Weeds, not the show, the movie. Right. With and, the movie, right. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, I know one of the cast members of your film. Who's that? Mark Ralston. Oh sure. How do you know Mark? So I. <laughs> I grew up on the Saw. I, I grew up on horror films, but the Saw movies were some of my favorites. And Mark was in the fifth and sixth. I originally met him in two thousand eight, but we came we became friends in two thousand twelve on the Saw cruise. It was one of these like celebrity cru parts of a cruise, but it was very oh wow. informal. It was very close encountered, and I knew the guy who represented them for since two thousand five. So he invited me, and a bunch of Saw fans came on, and it was very close encountered. Actually. Uh, Mark spoke about me on the news when I slept late because that was up with one of the other actors at the roulette table till two in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> but Mark told us some uh, a funny story about the, uh, working on the set with Ernie Hudson, Nick Nolte, um, Will Forsythe, who I've met. Ernie Hudson, I was supposed to see this weekend, but he had to cancel due to filming um, uh, responsibilities. Uh, I met Ernie Hudson a couple of times, William Forsythe too. Um, but uh, Mark was telling us about his friend John Tolls Bay, who was a street comic. Yeah, who, it was his first. It was his first role, and he had to die, and he didn't know how to do it, and uh, he was struggling. And Nick Nolte gave him advice, and he told us a funny story. I'm not going to say it on out of respect for Mark, but as as a joke, Ernie Hudson played on Nick Nolte during on set behind the scenes. I don't know if, if uh, I, I I think it, it's it's okay to say it's just like uh, Nick Nolte was trying to tell John Tolspey how to how to because he it was his first role, and he had to die. You know. I know for actors, it's very difficult to do that. Do you have to take a moment? No. Have, uh -uh. Oh, no I wasn't sure. Oh, um, I wanted so, to shut my door because I thought. There oh, yeah, please go ahead. Please go ahead. <coughs> yeah. So Mark was telling us how Nick Nolte, you know, when he was he was really it was the best from the best shape of his life. And he was telling he was telling uh, John Tolls Bay how to fake a death, you know, be able to do a successful death. And he's like, how did he say how to do it? He said, you got to take a wine cork and you stick it in your ass. But he said it in such a sincere, whatever. And they were trying not to laugh, but they were all laughing because it was Nick Nolte saying this. And the next day, Ernie Hudson came in and put a baby Ruth on the tip of a wine cork and said, you know, Nick, I tried that. And he handed it to Nick and ah. Nick freaked out, you know, so. <laughs> I don't know if you knew about that, but Mark told us that story on the saw. Like we we're talking about the funniest experience you had on set, and Mark Ralston said that was his number one. Well, so Nick, that's an obsession with Nick. I have two Nick Nolte stories. Mm -hmm. 
Um, Please. Uh, I was talking to him. Uh, you know, I did um, Bangalore on Soli with De Niro. Right. And I was talking to him about how physically he worked and that in the scene where he was supposed to be dizzy, he would, before we uh, rolled, he would uh, whirl in circles until he couldn't stand up. Or in a scene where he was supposed to be sick at his stomach, he would put his, before we rolled, he would put his finger down his throat until he was on the edge of throwing up. And uh, Nick said, yeah, when I want to play an uptight character, I put a cork up my ass. Uh, so he, he, it was evidently his approach to any any, any potential scene. Um, oh, that's so funny. Yeah. It's like a method actor. Yeah, but it's a, insane. It's, uh, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, but you said you had two stories about Nick, right? Well, they're too horrible. <laughs> they're too horrible. Okay. If, I, if, if Out of respect, if you don't want to say it to I Nick. will. I'll tell him. <laughs> one of Nick Nick's two most shameful moments according to him are uh, he found himself at some point uh, on a, maybe in Toronto or in some location someplace in a closet with his finger up his ass so I, he's got a problem with his asshole doesn't he so and he was putting at least he's not an asshole. Oh, I, I he would no, he was putting um some kind of drug up his ass and I guess went to sleep. <laughs> you know, they if you 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 go to you know, drugs up your ass take effect very quickly. <laughs> I, they... The other story is just too horrible. Uh I was, you can't help but tell it. I can't help but tell it. <laughs> I was I was visiting him in in um, Charleston before we did the picture. I went down there and we read it aloud and that kind of stuff. And we had a wonderful time. And then I went to bed. <clears throat> and I woke up in the morning and he was just getting home. He had gone out after I went to bed. And his tail was really between his legs. He was humiliated. He said that he had run out of Coke in some bar and he had snorted a biker's snot uh, to, for the possible residual Coke that was in it. So, oh my God. His wife was a doctor's daughter. So she made him have a. It, we, we thought at that point that all kinds of fluids would spread AIDS. So he had, right. he had to have a an AIDS test because he'd snorted a bike or snot. That was I thought that is pretty low. Yeah, that must have been at a low point in his life at the time. At the time. Well, it wasn't the the best of Nick. Right. But no, he but he's 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 listen, I've seen him in for not like his his performances, his uh, some of his the highest his highest uh, his peaks of his life. He was just in um, the Mandalorian, the other the first season a couple of years right. ago, and yeah. he played a much shorter guy. But <laughs> he, uh, you, I don't know if you watched it. He played like no. a different a different alien type of character, but who was much shorter. Okay. But uh, yeah, but you could tell, like you know, like you, you know, like you look at somebody, or even if it's their 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 faces, like Ron Perlman. Certain actors, no matter what they're animated to look like, you could tell which actor they are, regardless right. of the. And but you can also hear his voice. Yeah. But but I remember at the end of every uh, line he said, he said, "I have spoken," and it's just <laughs> like so, it's like he's like he says like he puts his foot down or he says like the most random thing that doesn't need. Assertive, uh, you know, any assertion, nope. and he has that. I have spoken. <laughs> it's just, and, but it's because you know it was Nick Nolte, but also he became such a likable but serious character. Like he was a very in the show, and then they kill, he got killed, and that was like the most darkest episode because everybody he became such a likable character, even with his his, his uniqueness. Just his, his well, character. I, like, I like I like Nick enormously, and we had a wonderful time shooting. He was very much. Uh, not on drugs when we were shooting weeds i mean or drinking that much he was you know trying to he was going for broke mark said he was sober lost weight looked like a stud yeah. that's what mark yeah. said yeah <clears throat> so it was good we had a wonderful time <clears throat> yeah. he's like somebody you'd go to high school with you know? 
Yeah, you know, Ernie Hudson's also a real mensch, as I say. William yeah. too. I uh, I was really I was really upset. I I uh, I was going to see Ernie this coming weekend. They were doing one of these horror conventions I usually go to, and they're having some of the Ghostbusters cast. He was the only Ghostbuster going to be there. I've met him there before, but he's such a nice guy. And I know another actor who's worked with him, uh, who's actually a co-star of Mark's, uh, Costas Mandalore, from oh. the Saw movies. I don't know if you know who that is. No. His brother is is also from my Big Fat Greek Wedding, and it's funny. I was watching, I was rewatching California Dreaming, and I realized that there's an actor in it, James Van Patten. Oh yeah, played Mike. I I thought I liked him. I thought he was wonderful. Yeah, and you know where I? He's also in the Saw movies with <laughs> Mark and Costas, and his and I don't know. I never met him, but I know his sister in law. Because oh. one of the main Saw actresses is also Mark's co-star, is what is one of the stars of the Saw movies, and um, I've known her for years. She actually she's such a sweet. We were on TV together once. She sponsored me. I have Tourette syndrome, so I'm very active in Tourette's events. And I go. To, she'd sponsor me in the Tourette's walk two years in a row. She's such a sweetheart. Oh great! And she's James' sister-in-law. It's, it's it's such a small. I'm Jewish, so it's like Jewish geography, even if you're not Jewish, you know. <laughs> You know, yeah. Who is she married to? Uh, I well, I mean, I think this was when she her her other marriage. Now she's she remarried in the last couple of years. Okay. And she's also Jewish, Betsy. Betsy Russell is her name. Okay. Betsy Russell. She was in the movie. What was it? It was um, it was from the. It was also like one of those teen American Pie dramas from the eighties, seventies. Um, I forgot what it was called, but it was like Animal House, but it was not as well known. Okay. And I'm the name escapes me, um, but you know. Also, I realize also what's his name who played the uh, TT. Uh, you know, I've I've also I recognize him immediately because I've seen him in a lot of things, Hunter including breaking, Stephen King's It. Breaking and, away. Yeah, right. yeah. But he was, and he was so young. And also, you know, it's interesting. Like I'm watching it, like this feels, even though it's from the '70s, this is like a teen com, a teen drama. It was really a dramedy too, because yeah. it it did have. You know, it had some really un, un, unsus, unsuspecting, unpredictable moments where you didn't think a character was going to die. And, right. you know, that whole thing where T.T. felt, you know, I had a friend who passed away at a very young age a few years ago. And one of my friends, who's her best friend, wished they made up a fight, uh, a fight they oh, had. Yeah. And they didn't. Right. So and I thought of that when T.T., you know, he lashed out at. And um, yeah, and that was the last thing he said to him before he had the heart right. attack. And uh, you know, there's a lot of realistic. You know, people don't even s relate or don't understand people who relate to a lot of characters and you know, story. You know, story elements in films, even the comedies, even the dramedies, even right. the rom coms. Some of them are so much more relevant than people realize. Sure. My friend Botolato had that with his father. He had been yelling at his father on the phone, and then his father died. And so, yeah, that was kind of what I was talking about there. But yeah, um, and it's, it was also in the script. It wasn't just me. I, I used Mark in Prancer too. He played the, the butcher who buys the deer. And all kinds I, of I actually I never saw. Is that that's a film you did? Or uh, yeah. I have to I have to check that one out. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I always been a fan of Mark, you know. I and actually I should be ashamed that I I told him this in 2008 when I first or eight when I first met him. Like, but this was or yeah, it was before I saw. I didn't even see Shawshank Redemption, and I already seen him in Saw Five. He was like, and this is when we first met before he really knew. Me. He says, "You saw Saw, but you never saw the Shawshank Redemption. You go home right now after this convention <laughs> and you go watch that." But yeah, Mark Mark's awesome. Uh, I I made him laugh a few times. I um. He's, we had a real good time on the cruise. I haven't seen him a few times since. Um, but, yeah, I haven't seen him since, I think, 2015 or 16. It's Or 14. I don't remember. It's been a few years. Maybe. I think it was 2015. I haven't but, seen him for a long time, yeah. Yeah. But he's such a great guy. Yeah. Um, same thing with Ernie and Bill. I never met Nick Melty. I don't know if he does these events like a lot of the guys do. But I would love to meet Nick at some point. Does Bill, sure. For Bill Forsyth goes to these events? Oh yeah, like I met him. I met him a number of times. I, and even times I didn't go up to him. He was at events. He's there for like The Rock and Halloween. Rob Zombie's Halloween. But he's he has a lot. He's been in a lot, like a yeah. lot over the years. Um, 
but I, first time I met him was probably 2006 or seven. That was the first time. But I've seen him at these things tons of times since. Yeah. Does, um, does this pay these guys? They. Oh, yeah. So, so these, yeah, believe it or not, you know, I remember George Lucas said something obnoxious about these things, and so did Will, Will, William Shatner, but uh, William Shatner makes a lot of money from it because you see these, you know, fans come from all over the world to these things. Even the ones that are like, there have them every other, sometimes when, this is my tick, sorry, it's one of my threads. Um, thank you. No, I'm very open about it, so yeah. it's one of my breathing ticks. Um People, you know, they have some before COVID, they had some every other week, you know, all over the country in different locations. Yeah, right. um, they would have sometimes they would overlap. So people would choose which one they want to go to. But they're all over the country. They're, they're in Germany. They're in they're in the UK. They have them all over. And actually, I sell a lot of the stuff I get autographed on eBay. And some of my biggest customers are in the UK and Germany. Wow. <laughs> like, But I don't just buy, get like photos and posters signed. My room, I have stuff used and worn in horror movies, like, <laughs> like not just horror movies. I have, I had Mark's blood, like in Saw 6, he gets his throat slit by one of these other actors I know from the, yeah. and he has like his whole suit is all covered in blood. And he actually has a funny behind the scenes story from that too. But I had his suit and I would bring him that to sign, you know, I sold that, but like I would have stuff and I would bring it to the actress to sign it and they were blown away. And, and some funny. of these... Yeah, like I have, I'll try to show you, like I have here, like some of the, that's worn by Samuel Jackson in a skit he did from Jura okay. of, regarding Jurassic Park. All These right. are all worn in different movies, and I have mannequins displaying them. I had Mark's bloody suit on there. I had his blazer from the movies, wow. you know, and there's a big market for these things, not just the posters and the photos, but screen use movie memorabilia. And Mark is, I told Mark about it, and he gets he gets blown away. Some of the other actors too about it, you know. Um, but how do these guys they they get paid per autograph? Or how oh yeah, that? so I don't know how the like the, yeah. So you sometimes the usually the agent makes up the price or the actor makes up the price. Sometimes it varies. They get paid. They like you go up to them. Usually depending on the usually you pay them at the table. You get an autograph. You get a photos. And like they sign it, you could do it a personalization. You don't have to do a personalization. You could bring your own things to get signed. They they get they get paid. And some people some people make more of a killing, so to speak, at these horror convention uh, autograph things than others. But it's you know I don't know how it works in terms of the convention. Like I don't work the convention. I have friends who right. do, but even them, even though they're volunteer staff, I'm not. I don't think they know how like the how like it how it works how like the agent makes a deal with the convention bait you know board or whatever the people in, who run the convention and it, how, how much of the agent is involved and the actors involved because sometimes the actor makes the price but sometimes the agents have the say like i've had actors who wanted to give me a free autograph but the agent or the person ma ma managing them at the time said no like like when they were there, they put their foot down. Like sometimes they do that, but or they can get away with it. Sometimes they can't. But like I, or, you know, I have to. We have to respect that. But sometimes it's not always up to the actor what they charge. Right. If, you know. But sometimes it is. It, it's hard to say because I don't really know. Their, they pay their plane fare and put them up in a hotel. And... Yeah. Uh, well, I, I believe. Yeah, I believe they. Yeah, they put them up. But usually it happens in a hotel. So they they book they they yeah. booked the hotel. I usually I believe, and it's not I don't I can't say for sure, but I believe the event takes care of the hotel for them because they run the hotel. They even have a a um, code for the fans that they get a discounted deal when they book the hotel through okay. the convention. You know, so I assume that the convention, you know, manage books the hotel yeah. for the celebrities. And makes the whole process e easier and enjoyable for them because the whole thing is to have fun, not just for the fans, but for the actors. And a lot of these actors enjoy the fans, like especially in the horror community, the horror movie community. Like the fans and the actors are just so authentic and and get, get we we have so much fun. Some you know I've befriended like not just Mark, I've befriended a lot of actors I used to grow up watching as okay. a kid, and like I'm very and not just actors, filmmakers like I, you know who Carrie Elwes is. Sure. Yeah. So he knows me for, oh, it's going to be 11 years and he absolutely loves me. Like we, we were in a more informal chill situation when we first met, but because a lot of things he got bigger, it's, but it's not always up to him. 
you know, when, when the agents and the security yeah. is, but whenever he sees me, he's so happy. You know, he gives me, I would come all the way to Jersey. Or, uh, I'm from New York, but like I would schlep on a Shabbos to go see him, Ugh. you know? And uh, yeah. Oh, it's, uh, and Carrie's also sort of a co-star of Mark. They weren't in the same Saw movies, but right. they were both in the Saw franchise. <laughs> but also, you know, you talk with like sort of my, I'm talking with you now about like you, you get into such deep conversations with the actors about their films and the fans open up about what it meant to them and how it changed their life or affected their life. Like and sometimes a lot to the actors, sure. And the filmmakers, you know, a lot of filmmakers have no idea the impact right. that their film would have and do have does have, you know, and some of these filmmakers I've spoken to on social media who I know outside some not, but like, they, they see how much these movies mean to the fans and how much it's some of these movies affected their life. And even the dark horror movies or graphic ones mm -hmm. really imp impact people's lives in way because a lot of fans are very observant and an analytic and very, they, they appreciate not just the detail and the creativity, but the underlying messages and the very deep meaning behind this character or this storyline or this element. And it's just a very special thing. That's why these conventions, uh, though people's always like nerds. No, it's like a home away from home for a lot of people. And people build families there, like like make friends from across the world. Well, I, the reason I was asking is I, mm -hmm. I uh, lived with Lindsay Wagner for a year. And she, I see she goes to these things, not horror ones, but she goes to them. And I, and she, I don't think she needs money. So I wondered why, and it must be for the human contact, right, for, with fans. Yeah, a lot of people don't don't need the money, but they still go. You know, yeah. it's you you get you get really big actors sometimes that go to these things who don't need the money, but you know what? They it, some people say I can never have too much money, but can they? Some, that too, yeah. say some people just <clears throat> really enjoy the experience and the time, and getting to really connect. Some people just love connecting with their fans. Yeah. So yeah. Listen, I, I was I was one I, I one actor I was on the Saw Cruise with, you know, we were he was, you know, we he, we, he got a ton of money for autographs and he when we were at the roulette table, he was just throwing away money and we're still just having fun together, you know? Right. And it's you know, but I mean he was doing well, but like still you never know with, with at the roulette table. So Right. I know it's really it's a really amazing thing, especially when you meet people and you, you hear things about people in the, in the film industry and you get nervous. They're going to be assholes. But a lot of people play villains and a lot of a lot. Most majority of the people I've met, like 99 percent have been authentic, real. But you, 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 you aren't limited to just the New York area. I mean, you'll. No, 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 not at all. Beyond New Jersey. Huh? I go to New Jersey. The one that happens every year on my birthday weekend, which this is the one year I would have gone, but I'm going to Jersey instead is. Texas Frightmare Weekend in Dallas, which is once a year. Usually these things happen all year round, okay. most of them. And, yeah, they've had Alice Cooper there. Um, they, they've had Paul Rudd at the one in Jersey, you know, when he was at a very high point in his life with Marvel, but he didn't have to. No. Kate Beckinsale. Um, wow. it, yeah. Yeah. A lot of these people um, just they don't need the money, but they do these events. And you know, also, you know, also Matthew Lillard, one of these horror actors, did say something very that I didn't think about, but it makes a good. He made a good point. Like he he said thank you to the fans because you like I have kids. He says, and you know, we're, actors we're not always working. So when I go to these things and you're supporting, you know, the the movies you love and the you know, you're supporting me to support my kids. You know, like you're <laughs> you're. He you said he made a good point because like. In, in the production field too, in the technical field, you're not necessarily, cons it's not a consistent nine to five job necessarily. You could be working for a year or two years straight on a film or six months or two months or a month. And then you could be off for like a few months or six months and sure. until the next job. So people yeah. don't really can't, don't appreciate the, the people in the film industry enough. And they assume a lot. They think all celebrities are so this or so that or so well off. You know what? People will naturally judge because that's human nature. But they have no part of my Tourette's fucking clue. Um, yeah. You know what they're yeah. talking about when they're talking about people in the film industry. Probably. You know, of course. 
Yeah. You know, there are some people who do other jobs when they're not working in the film, when the people who work in the film industry who are work other jobs when they're not working on sets or behind the camera or in front of the camera. So, you know, yeah. <laughs> I also, I wanted to, I, I wanted to uh, ask, uh, talk about Let's Scare Jessica to, to Ted. Yeah. Because I know that is a very, very deep movie, no pun intended, you know, with the, you know, the lake yeah. thing. But it's more of a, not an analogy, but it's, it was a metaphor. That's what I'm thinking to an extent. But also it's like you're, I feel like you, not only did you have a, do you have a reasoning for that, for how how that story was told and Jessica's story, but also you left things up to speculation. A lot of filmmakers do that because fans will come up with different, and this a lot of filmmakers, a lot of fans will come up with different, um, spec like speculate what that meant or how what really happened, and that's. Can you tell us a little bit about that Jessica's story and not just the ending but the Spoiler alert, everybody! Um, <laughs> like what? What you were? What were you were tr implying or telling in the for there? Well, I was uh, a fan of um, the turn of the screw, um, Henry James story, and. If you where, need to take a moment, if you need to take a moment to no, get, you're getting message, uh, it wasn't sure. where you don't know whether. Um, it's in her mind or not. So, uh, and that's what I tried to do with Jessica because I don't know, maybe I was feeling sufficiently confused by the world at that point in my life that um, that seemed to be uh, a reflection of the way things were, that the, the unknowability of things. <laughs> Or maybe I just uh, couldn't figure out how to s write a satisfactory ending where you knew what had happened. But somehow the two combined into uh, the ambivalence of that. And uh, the audience reaction to that has improved with time. People are more, more tolerant of that than some of the critics were when it opened. Um, I mean, it did good business, but it did actually great business. But the there were some reviews that that didn't like that you didn't find out whether whether it was in her mind or not. Um, now I think that's considered an asset by the people that are liking it. I, I think it's considered a, a like a people like uh, not just people audiences but critics like that now. They yeah. like that. Also, it was stud it's almost like studied in film as like, you know, an analysis of what was it? Um, uh, uh, her, what was it? Um, something regarding her uh, depend dependent dependability or what's the word? Her being dependent on men or her hate for her anger towards her husband. Or there was like a lot of different, I was reading up, there's a, there was different um interpretations and like uh, films now especially even back then but especially now films that are more left open-ended and left up to interpretation resonate very well with not just audiences but critics in a lot of cases i know some audiences want resolve they want closure yeah but sometimes that's not what you get and sometimes it's better not to get that because that oh, some people will feel that say that feels almost cliche like right. and you know what i don't think a a a an ending or a, a film with an underlying message or a metaphor has ever been considered a, a cliche not a, not a, not a, not yeah. a frowned upon cliche right but it's 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 like it's like something that people audiences and critics alike appreciate these days because so much film has been analyzed and studied and for for the sake of not just cinema but the human condition that it's it's something that really should you know stands out as opposed to you know is is not acknowledged or not appreciated it's something that really resonates with a lot more people than it used to well i was as i look back on it i 
I might, I mean, I was aware, I was aware of it at the time. I was exploring my mixed feelings about my first marriage, you know, uh, yeah. in that movie. Um, and not that I was tempted to kill my wife with a gas <laughs> or vice versa at all, but um, we were having trouble, you know. I'm sorry. That's all right. I know it's in the past, but still. Yeah. It's... Can I tell you something? It's like I say that I say that joke. Like buying your wife is a, a gun. Buying your wife a gun is like saying, "Honey, I want to kill myself, but I need it to be a surprise." <laughs> but that, now it's like a typical joke that people make, like about their wives or their husbands, like, uh, like uh, who, for the men who say um, women belong in the kitchen, that's where the knives are kept. Remember, that's where the <laughs> knives are kept. Or there's like. Uh, or, you know, that's like a stab at men. And then there's the jokes right. of stabs at your wife. Or, you know, then there's, I say, you know the movie Fight Club? Yeah, sure. So first rule of Right Club, your wife's the only member of Right Club. <laughs> you know, I, I make a joke that, like, I'm divorced. <coughs> I, I make a joke that say, I'm divorced. My wife told me I'm right. I couldn't keep going. And I, I filed for divorce seven minutes later. <laughs> How do you live a happy marriage after your wife tells you you're right? You know, like one of those... You know, now, now, even with cancel, uh, with with um, PC culture, we still laugh at a lot of these things because a lot of them, you know, people, some people just appreciate it, and it, it, it's we just laugh at it, and we make fun of ourselves, like men make fun of themselves, women, you know, we sure. we, we make fun of ourselves that we're married and we'll never have our freedom again. Or, well, I'm not married; I'm making a joke, but like, yeah. like what is or like I said, I, my wife and I decided not to have children. The kids are taking it really hard, you know, like <laughs> all these, you know, about having kids, you know. We have all these jokes, but they're really they're more relevant to our real life than we think about when we say them. Oh, you know sure. what I mean? Yeah. Sort of like with uh, these movies, the these met or the metaphors or the underlying meanings in them are more relevant to real life than we think about sometimes. Sure. Yeah, uh, it, it's also interesting. Like, <clears throat> I Foreman wrote a book called Lies Like Truth. What was that? Uh, that book about, or I think it was uh, a collection of his reviews on the New York Theater, but it's a, <laughs> it, it's um, it's an interesting concept that what we're trying to do is create falsehoods that actually reflect, you know, lies like truth. That actually, it's so interesting. It's, it's straightforward yet cryptic. Yeah, yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. Um, you know, I was thinking about, we also in Jessica, it just also, I, it's interesting because it seems like there's a time where she takes like a blade to the neck and there's another time where she looks like she's biting the neck. So it also, in a way, I think that it also makes it seem like it's in her head because she's not really clear. It's almost never clear. Is like, is she only biting them or is she, <laughs> is she taking something to their neck and then drinking the blood? Or is is like because you also see different types of scars on different men's neck. Maybe that could be symbolic of different ways she wanted to kill her husband, or different tools she wanted to use. Or see, I'm I'm coming up with my own, you know, sure. or 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 something some relevant to those men's um, you know, that like is in her subconscious that she doesn't even realize that you know something those men did to somebody else or what they dealt with, and so the scar looks different. Or it's in a different place. One's on the cheek. One's on the neck. One's behind the ear, by the ear. Right. You know, there's so many different ways to look at it. So the fact that there's so many different scars of where they would have been bitten by this vampire, uh, Emily, right? Emily. Sure. Um, it could also mean like it's all in her head because she's not even sure what a, the scar is supposed to look like, I guess you could say, yeah. or did look like, because every time she looks at one, it's a different scar. That's and true. also, then there's the friend of the the husband who doesn't get bit and turned; he gets killed. So um, that I'm well, curious, right. like, he gets his throat cut, doesn't he? Yeah. So what is is was that was there a reason for that, or was it just for the sake of the the shock value of that scene? Just because so it could be, yeah, leaning over backwards on the. Because that was that was terrifying. I like yeah. I liked I like that. I like it, that just, scene. Yeah. it was just it because it was like you, you see she's running after him. You think he's going to get off of it, and he's a vampire too. But you just see him laying there, 
backwards yeah. dead and it's like that's shocking yeah. but at the same time he's the only man she didn't turn except for the whatever the body that other body the the that she found i think of the fisherman or that she thought she found he comes back all oh, right you're right sorry yeah. Forgot, so maybe yeah. maybe the friend will come back after you're he right. finishes yeah. spraying the orchard <laughs> Or on on, on uh, what was it on, on not on purpose just from uh, from being sit, from sitting on the uh, whatever that thing was. Yeah, I'm not a gardener, or, or I don't right, I don't cultivate right. I don't cultivate gardens or crops or whatever you know. So I don't know well, what the God. best terminology. <laughs> Why have you done? Have to do that before? No, I do it. I'm I'm an avid gardener. Yeah. Really? Yeah. My father. My father. <coughs> my father always had an appreciation. For not just you know gardens, but antiques, scenery, architecture, um, and also because you grew up in New York. Yeah, Long Island. You can tell by my Long Island accent. <laughs> um, my fa but I was raised on classical music, classical music, classical movies, and classical rock. So I, I have appreciation for all forms of art. Uh, hundred, hundreds of years of music. What? Why, why and classical music? How'd that happen? My my, my I was very my family was very big on like Pachelbel, Beethoven, Chopin. So I always, I grew up with yeah. appreciation for that. I, I've been playing piano now 20, almost, it's going to be 27 years in August. Oh. I stopped lessons after 15 years, still teach myself, but I grew up loving classical music and I, I learned Beethoven. When I was, a, I was as young as 10 or 11. Yeah, me too. Yeah. And I never gave up music. I stopped lessons, but I still teach myself. And because I have Tourette's syndrome, music is a very big healing thing for people with neurological disabilities and it um it really makes a difference whether be listening to music or making music so i have a big appreciation for like not just you know all the you know antiques and architecture and and scenery and and beautiful yeah. you know but classical music and music stating back and, and also over 100 years of film like i grew up on the classics and it's funny abbott and castello meet frankenstein was actually the film that got me into horror when i was five uh -huh. And then I watched Bride of Frankenstein, House on Haunted Hill, I think was the first film that ever scared me. And ever since then, Vincent Price was, what, was one of my favorite actors. Donald Pleasance, I think, was my next favorite. Like, I have like four favorite actors, and Vincent Price and Donald Pleasance were my favorites. Donald Pleasance, simply because of his role in Halloween as Dr. Samuel Loomis. Like, there was something about that role that he, like, he, that he, did gave to he he contributed to it that he his performance of Dr. Loomis nothing will ever compare to me. Oh, he like was that. a wonderful actor. Yeah. Yeah. I would he's see him and Vincent Price's people I would love to meet. I met Vincent Price's daughter. <coughs> and she was a sweetheart. I told her <coughs> when I watched Edward Scissorhands, when he his character died, I said I cried. She says I cry every time and she gave me a hug. Uh, but I I was almost in tears then because like he I grew up on the classics. I'm 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 I um transitioned to more modern horror and sci-fi, Chucky, aliens, and but I always had an appreciation for at, at all deck all generations of film, and all time er you know all eras of music. So well, that's, that's you know, valuable. That's rich. Yeah, I, I, I first saw Donald Pleasance on Broadway in Caretaker. Really? Oh, I, he was good. Yeah. Wow. It was a great production with. Robert Shaw and Alan. Uh, oh, I forget his last name. Not Olda or Arkin. No, uh, English actor Alan. Oh, uh, he was in a million movies. Alan. Uh, I'm sure. I'm sure. I'm sure. As soon as we sign off in about yeah, twenty yeah. minutes, you're going to remember. Yeah. <laughs> That's usually how it is. My mother saw Angela Lansbury in Sweeney Todd. I think. Uh -huh. And that's uh, that I would have loved to see. I also would have loved to see my mother saw him perform. And I, because I'm big on puns and music, I, I would, people tell me I should do stand up. I said, no, I'd rather just sit down, but I'd rather, you know, seriously, I'd rather play piano on stage. But Victor Borgia, I would have loved to see perform, but, you know, oh, he yeah, was. I, I never did, except on yeah. television. Yeah. Yeah. My mother saw him perform. My mother saw Jerry Orbach uh, perform in, in Broadway. I, and I didn't, I had no idea he was a theater actor either. Oh, he was um, I, I knew him from the actor's studio. Really? Yeah. Wow. Mark told us how he he went to see Hamlet, uh, and he said, who played Hamlet? And he said he was drunk as a skunk. Um, 
And he said, and he said, he said like that. And somebody said, Ned Bellamy from also, who was his co-star from Social said, that's the way to do it. Hamlet drunk. And who was the one? Oh, um, Arthur, you know, what's his name? Mark told us who played him. And I'm trying to remember, but he said he, he went on stage and he had to, he had to collect himself. He walked back up, but Mark was telling us a story and I can't, again, I'm going to remember the name probably. I remember who it minutes. was. Who was it? I, I wonder. Yeah. Oh Yeah. I'm, I'm trying to remember. Did he see it in New York or Los Angeles? Or he didn't. He didn't say. He just said yeah. he went to see Hamlet, and it was. Um, I forgot the guys. It started with with an A, I think. Um, oh, another also cl uh, classic, you know, famous old time actor that not old, time, but like I um, I forgot his name, but he was but he was from like a while back. But he was saying he was drunk when he was on there, you know. And uh, listen, I've heard great stories about. These guys, like a lot of these guys, I wish I met, <coughs> I wish I saw perform. Like, for example, like Frank Sinatra and uh, his relationship with what's his name, the the short, heavy, bald guy. Um, and I'm he's like oh, Don Rickles. Don Rickles. Oh yeah. I know as a weird way to say it because that could be anybody. That could be Danny DeVito. That could be. Um, but like how Don and him had such a weird relationship, but they were such good friends. Like Don said, you know, I'm going to be at one of your shows. I'm going to have a date. I want you to come up to the table, and introduce us. And then Don's sitting there eating with his his date. And Frank Sinatra, of course, comes up to the table. And I was like, leave us alone, Frank. I'm fucking eating here. Get out of here. You know, like, like and Frank, <laughs> Frank, Frank was ready to strangle him. But like yeah. they had that thing where they messed with each other, you know. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, I, I always love to hear that. Like we're talking about Nick Nolte and Ernie Hudson. On you were able, like sometimes you got to do that on set to, ke to keep your sanity. You got to mess with it. You know, you got to. I know other actors that say you got to play jokes sometimes on set because sometimes it gets so hectic. You need a laugh, and you, depending on the film, you need your you need to keep your sanity. And sometimes playing pranks on each other, which some times people do, or in I old think do on things that, in on on. on some of John Ford's sets, what you would do is you'd pee, down, pee on somebody's leg as you were standing next to him watching behind the camera. Really? Yeah. That's hilarious. Oh, my God. You know, it's uh, one, one of the Marx films. Oh, I think they did it on the one before Mark joined the Saw films. They had a fart machine that they were trying to film a serious role. And the director, not even the actors, the director, they, they would they would use this fart machine when the, to see if the character would, the actor would break character during a take. Huh. Like, and it was to be so loud. And they'd be standing there watching on the monitor and cracking up. And the guy's trying to be serious and he's like almost on the floor laughing. Huh. You know, they would use whoopee cushions and, and just the most, you know, for a character that's supposed to be on his deathbed. And it's just like... Huh. It's just, it's, it, it you know, people, it, the, the amount of fun I'm sure people have on sets. And I, you know, I've worked on shoots. I've never worked on a set. That's my dream to, to direct well is my dream. You know, I actually wrote a piano piece for an upcoming horror movie um, that I was also trying to be a photographer, a BTS photographer for, but because I'm in New York, they, it was easier to get them somebody from LA. But um, I don't know if you know who Leanna Quigley is, the Scream Queen or uh, no. Uh -huh. no. Yeah, I don't know if you. I don't know if I know you did just scare Jessica to death, but I know I'm not sure if you did. I, I I knew you did Hill Street Blues. Yeah, that and I, you know, that I've heard that that's the most. From what I've heard, that's the most accurate depiction of what a police, uh, police um, precinct is like. Well, they did a, they, they did a lot of research. I mean, it was very much, uh, you know, <laughs> based by people with a documentary impulse, and they, they wanted to. That's what they were trying to do, I think, Bochka. How, what was their, what, how many seasons did they have of Hill Street Blues? I don't know, seven or eight. You know, even, you know, it's interesting because it probably, they probably, did, you didn't get that like intense action as much as you would in some of the other stuff. But you, but you did see, I mean, it's just interesting how it lasted so long, but out of, out of its authenticity and its reality. The, you know, the it's, cast was good. Yeah, 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 100%. I used to, and listen, the writing was good. I mean, it was a good, it was a good, it was a, a good writers' room, and they had a very uh, effective camera style that they made us all. I remember work in. Yeah, I used to watch. You know, my 
when I, you know, when I was a kid, I only had a few, very, very few good friends when I was young. But I, there, sometimes I would sleep over at my grandmother's apartment, which was local, and we, I would rent from Blockbuster. We would watch if we didn't watch like stuff from like Happy Days or or Twilight Zone. We would watch Clue. We would watch all these. I grew up on not just the old movies, but the TV shows. Right. My grandmother and I would binge watch Golden Girls, but we would watch Hill Street Blues. Right. We would watch. Um, not just to go uh, man like mash i couldn't appreciate it until i got older but like i didn't understand the humor when i was a kid and and now i watch it and i really appreciate it but i was raised on good like, episodic uh, television yeah. yes 100 <laughs> percent. I, I was actually <laughs> i was one of the few that liked rod serling's night gallery more than the twilight i love the twilight zone don't get me wrong and i know you did the you did the 80s yeah. Um, revision, you know, the, the, the reimagining. Yeah. But um, I was one of those few that liked from the original. I liked Rod Serling's night gallery more than his, really? his original twilight zone. You know, it wasn't even the color. I actually, it scared me more. There were episodes that felt, cause I felt like because it was a later time, they were able to do more like darker stuff that, and they had more technology in terms of what they, and the prosthetics and stuff were scarier yeah. than what they had during the Twilight Zone. It just what, and an, I like what an interesting artist he was. Also, yeah. I'm, I'm I just learned recently that he was a huge fan of Jessica. Really? He took it all over the country talking about it, and you know, there must be there must have been an honor for you. Had you ever have you ever been able to meet him? No, but it must I, have been. I just learned like a year ago. Wow. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, right. Yeah. But regardless, it must have been an honor to do some of the Twilight Zone episodes from the 80s yourself. I think he was dead then. No, I know, but yeah. still, it's oh, it must was, have been yeah. an honor. Yeah, and, and yeah. I liked doing those. I liked uh, they, it. was uh, Phil DeGuerre and Harvey Friend, and it had wonderful ADs and a good DP. I liked doing those Twilight Zones. They were, it was a very classy and good operation that Phil DeGuerre was the executive producer ran. Yeah, I um, I, I didn't just I you know I even I remember I they they used to have tw uh um what's it called marathons of those too the ones from yep. the eighties I I didn't just watch the the black and white ones I grew up on those and I think they were very underrated if you ask me I think because I think people are very big on what comes first but I don't think by definition just because it came first is therefore superior or better I really like the 80s Twilight Zones and actually I, I also like the movie I don't know the movie I don't know if you ever seen the Twilight Zone movie they did no also that was they took episodes from the originals and remade it's sort of like what they did with the 80s some of the Twilight 80s but they made like a movie out of it so John Lithgow played William Shatner's role in There's Something on the Wing of the Plane, and Dan Aykroyd was also in that. Oh, I did see it, yeah. Yeah, they did a little spin yeah. on that. That that movie gave me nightmares, yeah. the Twilight Zone movie. No, like, the originals, the original black and white ones never it were scary, but they never gave yeah. me nightmares. Right. The movie did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Who directed that? You know what? I remember it was somebody big, and I, you know, let me quickly look it up. Just for the hell of it. So it wasn't John Landis. You know what? I think it might be. And that's the one where you said lower, bigger. Yeah, John Landis, Steven Spielberg, and Joe Dante, and George Miller. And decapitated uh, an actor, didn't he? What, 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 what happened? I think it was on that that John Landis shouting bigger, lower up to the helicopter. And somebody literally got decapitated? Yes, and some wow. children were killed. Yeah. Oh my God! I know that there, there, there have been accidents where people have died or lost, even lost limbs on set. Yeah, I know it was, a, it was a, an important actor that got decapitated. Re it, 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 oh wow! Did they use him in the? Do you know if they used him in the remaining of the movie? If uh, or the one who got decapitated? That's you mean in the, the Twilight Zone movie? Yeah. I gotta look that up. I'm very, I'm very, I'm very. It's scary but i'm just curious you know i met john landis's son uh through friends of mine uh who are horror producers from my neighborhood uh who jewish kids who became horror producers working in, in the film industry now but yeah that was john landis steven spielberg joe dante and george miller yeah it was dan Aykroyd, albert brooks scatman cuthers crothers john lithgow vic morrow and kathleen quinlan yes it was vic morrow McCarthy. Vic Morrow got decapitated. 
Wow. Emily, Kevin McCarthy, John Larroquette of Scatman. Yeah, I, I know Scat. Yeah. Wow, that's that's crazy. And a couple kids were killed, I think, too. I know Poltergeist had a had a his, uh, you know there were several big movies that had a that death. had unfortunate you know deaths or terrible accidents on and or terrible accidents on set. It's uh, it, it, you know people think it'll add to the to, to the shot the terror value, but it really is in real life. It's just a really unfortunate situation. Um. Yeah, I've never had that. Thank God. Thank God. Yeah, no, hundred percent. No. Yeah, it's. Uh, I know they they were doing the six Resident Evil movie, and one one guy one. Uh, I I don't know if it was that film, but I but one one actor. But in terms of for, that, a guy. I think they said a PA or somebody got killed by a car, like crushed by a car, but uh, between two cars. But like I know for the Resident Evil movie, what exactly happened was the stunt double for one of the actresses had to get lost her arm and because of that not only did she have a lawsuit with the the, the production you know the production you know they had to cut like half an hour of the movie out as part of that lawsuit i think because like like there was supposed to be a whole epic opening scene regarding these characters but they basically killed basically killed them all off but their involvement, that basically, you, there's like they erased the entire opening scene because one of those actresses' stunt doubles lost her arm in an accident. So, I think of the opening, the first day of photography of Doctor Zhivago, they were doing. It's a scene where everybody, you know, uh, chases a train, and some got on, and some don't, and uh, Omar Sharif and his and his family are on the train and uh, they're trying to pull people on into the box car and that kind of thing. And yeah. there was a woman who fell under the train and had her legs cut off. Oof. And wow. um, David Lean broke for lunch, <laughs> but he had 500 extras hired for the day. So he went ahead and shot the afternoon uh which was considered uh cold-hearted and people hated him for it I, you know what i don't blame him not that i would hate i not what i would like to hate but like that's you know what i can i tell you something it's like i wouldn't i wouldn't like so what was it the story with brandon lee yeah during the crow and he got and then his father took over the role even yeah. though he said you know can i tell you something i wouldn't consider that cold-hearted I mean, he's he's almost like paying tribute to his son in a sense, but also, you know, it's what was it? Um, you know, uh, like then, like there were certain actors that were just lost their their loved one, but they would go right back to filming films because they needed. They, like, can I tell you something? For me, not being productive, not doing enough, is is emotionally and psychologically draining. I like being busy. I like being like the shop like for me shabbos you know the day of rest mm -hmm. is unproductive and i like i because i grew up with it i naturally sleep all day on it but i rather not because it throws off my whole work sledge schedule i like to be productive i like to be busy yeah. i like to be animated i get more tired from not doing too much than not doing enough so you approve of david lean no 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 i don't approve of that i think that you know people should be given time to mourn or like, especially when it's it's your like your responsibility to watch over that person. When it's your responsibility for the safety of the people on set, and then you like almost like almost like almost nullify her tragedy. You know, I'm saying like so, there, like there has to be obviously there has to be some mourning period, not moment what moment of silence, whatever you call it, but like take out of respect to the person who died or lost. So lunch, lunch wasn't enough. Lunch was because you're benefiting from that. You're not supposed to benefit from you know, <laughs> so you know what I mean. Um but I'm saying like some like then I think it was was it Dennis Quaid who lost uh no 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 um Liam Neeson when his you know like these actors when when his wife passed away like right and some and they go 
right oh, oh not right back into filming but they go back into filming not long after but you yeah. know what it's it's good sight mentally it's healthy of course it so is. be busy especially after a loss you know, <laughs> like sit around and mope and feel yeah. star you know and you know there's only so long you should have to mourn you don't want to like spend days well days of course or maybe a week or two but don't spend months feeling down like all it does is hurt you hurt your heart hurt your mental health do what's healthier for you but also but it's not it's not out of disrespect for the person lost i'm sure they want you to be healthy they want you to be happy and go on with your life the person if if you cared about them they loved you or you love them even if they didn't like like but like some but at, but if somebody especially somebody who didn't die who sees like you almost like they act like you nothing bad happened to you in the you know and like they just go on their way, their day, like nothing terrible happened. That's that's not just disrespectful. That's like horrible. But like that's that's like less than a day. I'm like, you know, if something terrible happened, there should be a not just a mourning period, but out of respect for you know, especially. I mean, whether somebody died on a set or hurt on a set, it was something that happened in real life. You know, with the person still alive. You know care for them watch over them you know be there for them if they died of course mourn but don't let it take over your entire life and prevent you from doing everything you love because your loved one would obviously want you to be happy and not you know shorten what's what the beauty, beauty of your life you know what's the great great about your life because theirs is over they'd want they if they loved you they'd want you to be happy you know that time oh, sure sure what could have possessed alec one to say it wasn't his fault yeah i i didn't watch the interview i heard a lot you know i heard a lot of mixed things uh, you know in terms of the producers it's a really unfortunate situation that should have never happened and it an innocent you know very creative young aspiring very successful young mind was you know person it's, it's, it was a very unfortunate event. You know, my cousin was was a teacher. My mother's cousin were a teacher for famous people's kids, including Will Smith's kids, Alec Baldwin's kids, and Kim Bassinger's kids. Kim Bassinger used to TA with my cousin for all these celebrities' kids in California years ago. Uh -huh. I never met Alex, but I know when I was in Queens College in New York, him and Julianne Moore were scouting my classroom to shoot something because they were shooting something in my... They shot a lot in my school. They shot a scene with Larry David and... and um, where Bernie was, Sanders for an was, SNL skit. Where was your school? Queens College in Queens, New York, in okay. Flushing. Yeah, they filmed scenes from Sex in the City and yeah. and and Blacklist. They would film a lot. There was I would walk into my media office and there'd be bullet holes in the walls. Oh yeah, they just shot a scene from Person of Interest here earlier today. Ah. It was just like it's just so funny. It was like, and there were times Kevin Bacon would come. They would shoot like scenes from the following in my the the Science Lab building. And of course, that one day when Kevin Bacon's there, I'm at a production internship where I'm not doing anything. They're not using me to my potential. There's like nothing going on. And of uh, course, I'm missing the day Kevin Bacon's filming in my school. Oh, that's bitter. <laughs> yeah, you know, you know, my grandmother knew Shelley Winters because my my great aunt married Shelley Winters' first cousin. So my grandmother oh, okay. was, yeah, my grandmother was close friends with Shelley Winters. I saw her do Juliet at the actor studio. Really? It was, it was not particularly effective casting oh no that's a shame i i watched i had a disaster film class at college and we watched poseidon adventure with and that you know i, I she'll always be that jewish grandmother with ernest born nine who was on their way to israel to see their new grandchildren to me <laughs> you know but anyway i know we're over our hour but John, well, I've, I've enjoyed uh, talking to you i think it's um, absolutely I it's been well. a pleasure yeah. yeah for sure and um i uh, listen this will go live i don't know if you have facebook or you uh, you I can check it out on youtube yeah. oh yeah so uh it's good i'll 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 email you or i'll send you the link okay however to what to like it's going to go um it's going to go live not live it's going to air to, this video is going to air tomorrow night so you could have it okay and, we're probably gonna add, we're gonna add it on IMDb, so you'll you'll have okay. that on IMDb. Yeah. Okay. Um, wonderful. It's been a pleasure talking to yeah, you. And, and again, it is a small world. I'm sorry I'm not seeing Ernie Hudson. I would have sent him your regards. I would have. I was supposed to see him. Yeah. I might see him in August then. Well, please. Yeah. When I see him, I will. I'll tell. I gotta. I gotta reach out to Mark. 
I don't I don't have his contact info, but we've spoken a little bit via Instagram, yeah, whatever. Say hello to him too. I just, I'm very. I will. Him. When yeah. was the last time you you spoke to Mark? Long, time. Last question? Long, time. Long time. Yeah. Yeah. When I see them, I'll send you their regards, and I'll, okay. I'll even I'll send Mark the link, however it is, to okay. our video, so you okay. can check it out. Okay. All the best to you, John. Same to you.